there's a book called The 22 Immutable Laws of Branding. Good book. And so I started to learn things about the law of color. You know, you want to own a color in the mind of the consumer. And so as I start to think about 93 Boys, I'm like, uh, gas, you also want to own a word in the mind of the consumer. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, or a phrase, like Jimmy John's is freaky fast or something like Just that. Just do it for Nike. Yeah. Just do it as Nike. You Assets know I mean? over liability. All right, guys, welcome back. Yeah. We back home, man. Been running around the world. So, um, so to today's home. special, special episode. We got Big Mensa coming from the South, the South, South, so, South, yes, South. Recording South. artist, fashion icon. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna throw that in there. He came Entre- prepared. Thank entrepreneur, um, Chicago in, and uh, all around. I, I think a, a voice of of his generation. Yeah, I think he's one of these people that have become a voice of of his generation. Thought leader. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be an interesting conversation for a variety of different reasons and different topics. But first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate Yo, it. Yo, I appreciate y'all for having me in such a major way, man. Like, I'm a big fan of what y'all do. It's love. And just the information that you guys push forward. I feel like obviously we're in a time when information is available, but it's not always prioritized. There's so much propaganda. And y'all building a platform based on informing, like, I've literally learned things I'm implementing into my business through watching you guys that's what's and up. your conversation. Incredible, Appreciate incredible, that, incredible. That's what it's about, man. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I want to jump right into it. I want to talk about the entrepreneur. Let's talk about that first. So um, you're heavily involved in the cannabis space. Word. Right? You just you just dropped a new venture, 93 Boys. Yes, sir. Um, so talk about this. It's interesting because I heard you say that... Um, Selling weed was like the first, it taught you taught you some valuable lessons early. 100%. And now you're doing it on a whole different level. So talk about your evolution in the marijuana space and, and where you are now with the 93 Boys. Yeah, I got you. So we launched 93 Boys about a year ago today, pretty much. 420 of oh, congrats, 2022. Congrats, congrats. Um, as the first Black-owned cannabis to be legally sold in Illinois dispensaries. So fast forward about a year. We have sold to and are in pretty much all of the 105, 110, 115 dispensaries in the state of Illinois. And, um, you know, it, it's grown exponentially, like, immediately. And it is a full circle moment for me, though, because I did start hustling um, very early, maybe 11, 12 years old. And before I was rapping, I was selling weed. That was what taught me punctuality you know what <laughs> I mean punctuality <laughs> for real because for real sure. it was like it was the first thing in my life where I was directly incentivized to work because I saw immediate return and this is on the south side of Chicago mm-hmm. so it's like if I wake up at 6am and I bag up all my grams and my eighths before I go to school then I come home with a knot you know or if I stay home or if I stay awake until midnight 1am to make this serve like recklessly out the window of my mom's house into the alley, you know, I get paid. And it really made the equation of hard work equals success make sense to me. You know what I'm saying? Because I was always in the fashion and I was looking for ways to get fly primarily. And also to to record money for studio time. Mm -hmm. And selling weed was the gateway into that for me that funded all of my earliest music projects and in a lot of ways taught me the concept of developing clientele because I was hustling with superior product packaging you know basically branding and then about a year later I had a mixtape so now I have concert tickets how old were you in a mixtape 16. So, oh yeah, let's go back a little bit. You say you started hustling when you was 11? Trying. Trying. Trying <laughs> to. <laughs> Key words. <laughs> I was trying. You know, yeah, it was yeah. like, I, I, I was shady. You know, I'm not going to lie. Like, I would take the guts out of a blunt and put right. them in the bag and try to sell them to rich kids or like... Who sold me this dirt? <laughs> <laughs> Straight <laughs> dirt. Like, trying to intimidate them into, you know... Take the, it, man. Rich kids it. at the school trying to intimidate them. But then I also had like Reggie. 
you know, and I was trying to sell that to high schoolers. And they like, damn, shorty, you ain't even got no mids. I'm like, nigga, take it or leave it. Straight to the moon. <laughs> you know? So who, who even put you in the mind frame of, because it's like you have to have some kind of um, person that you're looking up to or somebody that's mentoring you. Like who, who right. how did you, because that's. I never really thought about that. You yeah. know, I was a graffiti writer. I grew up writing graffiti. As we were discussing a second ago, like I'm a real student of hip hop. So hip hop for me didn't start with like, 106 in Park, for real. I mean, it did, but hip hop for me didn't start with commercialism. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it started with like like purest hip hop shit, like break dancing and graffiti was what I did before rapping. Um, and so, I was a graffiti writer, and my big homies were closer to like my age now, when I was mm -hmm. a little kid, and they was graph writers who sold weed. You know, so I think probably being around those guys that were like selling weed at that time made me, I mean, the first time I went in my guy's house and I seen he had like, I don't know, some ounces on the table. It looked like a hundred pounds to me. <laughs> you know, Snowfall. Franklin in the flesh. I was like, you know, I went home like, what did I just see? I felt like Vic Saint. <laughs> I was like, what did I just see? You know, so I, I started trying my hand at it, man. But, you know, I wasn't very successful early on. But when I got into high school though, I started to make it make sense, you know, and I was like looking for quality strains and um, just like a good plug and, you know, attempting to be consistent with it. And it started to bear fruit. So this is interesting because you're a hip hop purist. Your environment that you're growing up in in the south side of Chicago, the sound that's coming from it is not the sound that you study. So when you're trying to create your own sound in music, because what, I mean, the entrepreneurial journey has two gaps, right? It, it starts out at Sound of Weed and it, we're back to Sound of Weed, but in between it, the music was what people were knowing you for. How did you try to figure out the sound that you were gonna deliver to the world? Well, the sound that was coming from the South Side of Chicago at the time when I was becoming an artist was actually very similar to the sound that I've developed personally in a way, because it was Lupe Fiasco, mm, the kick pusher, right? Kanye, and Common. You know what I mean? Like for me, that obviously was, that, I was, that was before drill. That was this before, before drill. Sosa comes. Drill comes into play around the time that I come into play. You know, on the world stage. Okay. Myself and Chance and you know our friends and contemporaries. We all emerged at the same moment. Like I, I had a bar that I said the other day and something. It was like. Um, Somebody, I emerged in the same time and moment as Drill, just to think. Uh, but I never killed no one. I just got a human appeal, that musical skill and truth to reveal, something like that. But it was like, it was the same moment. It's like 2013 when, you know, I started touring America and Europe and Australia. And, you know, we were at South by Southwest and Chief Keef has just come out. Mm -hmm. You know, we're standing on vans and turning up to it. It was all the same time, but growing up, like in high school, um, I was like deeply entranced by like Lupe Fiasco. You know what I'm saying? That's my guy. Yeah. Of course, Kanye West and <laughs> and Common was actually my favorite MC. So it was like this is food and liquor. This okay. is food and liquor. Yeah. And this is and this, it's cool. The food yeah. and liquor is classic, but it's crazy. I've, the past couple of flights, all I've been listening to was B. I think it's just one of the most. You classic, know what I'm saying? That's I mean, a classic what an album. Amazing album. So that's the music that's the soundtrack to my bus rides. And when I'm on the train going to buy that work or whatever, like I'm listening to Common and I'm hearing him, you know, dissect complex topics of history and faith and love and struggle and everything in between. And that's what informed me as, uh, as a writer, as a poet, as a rapper was that, music of course i loved twister and you know more like street chicago music as well but the biggest music in chicago at that time was kanye west yes you know and yes. lupe was huge too yes yeah lupe definitely had a buzz for sure yeah you know what i mean first came out i was in college i oh, definitely bumped definitely that a ton. so that was the music that really spoke to me so you guys are the first black owned cannabis company in chicago is that correct to sell flour i actually got into a little bit of a Tizzy with some guys that oh they like had, oh, we got it no. they was like and, and they've been selling like um like bongs and okay. like you know some uh what do you call those accessories okay, okay you know what I'm saying but 
Um, as far as like selling actual cannabis flower in Illinois dispensaries, yeah, 93 Boys is the first one to get on the shelves. So, all right, how are you able to do that? Like, what's the process? Because we're going to talk about like as far as the inequity, as far as for black entrepreneurs in the marijuana space, I think it's less than 2%. Um, <sighs> Crazy. So being that you guys were the first, how'd you, how'd you do that? And what were the hurdles, like what were the licenses and all that mm -hmm. stuff that you had to do? Yeah, honestly, there's so many hurdles and it's a travesty that there are so few black owned brands in the state. I think to this day, there's still maybe like three or four on the shelves by now in Illinois and nationally, like you said, it's below 4%, maybe even 2%, lower than that in Chicago and Illinois for sure. And it's crazy because this is something that's been used to destroy, decimate mm -hmm. our communities. Yep. You know, it's been criminalized and weaponized against us. And then as they decide that it can be a moneymaker, we've been kept at bay and denied a seat at the table. So when the laws began to change in Illinois, immediately I just put my sights on it, you know. I, I've been back in the black market and or the traditional market as we call it. You know. <laughs> that was very that was a very nice way to put it. That's what they say. I said yeah. the other day I learned that. I was like, I like that. Cause it's true though. Yes. You know, there's no need to like more, more demonize, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like the traditional market. Yeah, the black market. That's more, the more marijuana sold there anyway. Yeah, what one hundred percent is way more lucrative. Yeah. Uh, it's just like so much that comes along with that. It's like I don't be trying to deal with that shit. Um, but I had been back in that space. And so as the law started to change, I really just got vocal, man. I'm going to tell the truth. You know what I mean? I was like just getting on newspapers and shit, being like, yeah, we need to be in here. You know, obviously I'm advocating for myself, but what I am as a man is an advocate for us as well in mm -hmm. anything that I'm doing. And so my speech and my focus was really on the need for substantial inclusion of our community as this plant is legalized. And I also started applying for all the licenses, you know, from dispensary to cultivation. Uh, my, my boy, who I've been building this shit with, he is growing down in Michigan. And um, so we were building our brand already. We were, I was being vocal and loud on newspapers about getting in legally and applying for licenses. And I'm just looking for whatever way this is going to work is the way I'm going to go first. People had always told me branding was really where you want to be at. Um, mentors of mine and just friends that are in the cannabis space in other legal states. And ultimately, the way that 93 Boys became the first to make it into the dispensaries to do a licensing deal. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't easy because then everybody would have done it. You know what I mean? But that was how it unfolded. It was like people taking note of what I was saying and what I was doing and knowing my track record with like investment into the community and that mm -hmm. anything I'm doing is going to be um, uplifting the the people, you know what I mean, that need to be impacted. And so I pulled a licensing deal with one of the larger producers in the state that has the highest quality flour, while at the same time making sure that I retained the vast majority, the lion's share of the equity and ownership of the actual brand. And now that the brand is established and moving, now, you know, it's time for the vertical integration. But the most important thing to me was always to do the brand. And so I started studying branding. Even like right now I'm wearing these shades, you know what I mean? Um, now I feel kind of funny because y'all not wearing shades. You know what I mean? <laughs> Pass I my shades, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to keep these on until I started to talk about this because um, when I started studying branding, there's a book called The 22 Immutable Laws of Branding. Good book. And so I started to learn things about the law of color. You know, you want to own a color in the mind of the consumer. So what color is Coca-Cola? Red. Red. You know what I mean? Blue. Starbucks, what's that? Pepsi, red and blue. Green. Colors, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yep. And so as I started to think about 
93 boys, I'm like, uh, gas, you also want to own a word in the mind of the consumer. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, or a phrase, like Jimmy John's is freaky fast or something like Just that. Just do it for Nike. Yeah. Just do it as Nike. Well, you assets know I mean? over liabilities. Part of that's that dope. before? That's Killed that. You know one. what I mean? Even like <laughs> ones that I didn't necessarily know, like Mercedes Benz is prestige, you know? So with 93 boys, I was like gas, everything gas, push the color yellow. And one of the most pivotal laws of branding is to be the first, you know? So I was just racing like to get 93 boys in there as the first, you know, brand of black ownership in the state because it's such a powerful tool, marketing tool, honestly, you know what I mean? Being the first. Um, and another thing I learned through that was like publicity over advertisement, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I was thinking about billboards and all that type of shit. Um, but instead I chose to like get ill with like PR and like campaigns online with other people posting, talking about the shit they were doing. Cause it's so, it resonates more, more. Yeah. you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. With somebody else, obviously like, if somebody tells you Vic Mensa's is nice, you're going to be like, damn, I should check it out. If I come to you and I tell you, yo, I'm dead nice, nice bro. G. <laughs> like, yeah. How many niggas tell you that? I'd never <laughs> really believe them. You know what I mean? How, how do you, how did you manage that? Right. Cause you're trying to build a brand, but as an artist, you have a brand as itself. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And there's certain things like that are going on in your, in your career that there's ups and downs inside your career, but you still want people to believe in this new brand or this mm -hmm. new venture. How did you manage to deal with that? Cause that's, that's, that's not easy. No, that's facts, man. And I think ultimately 93 boys being rooted in the ethos that I built it with has served it immensely as well. Like what we like to say is that a portion of every proceeds go back to the community. So we started off with creative solutions and programs in the city of Chicago. And that's what we continue to push. It's like, I look at it as three C's. It's like, cultivation, culture, and community. And um, the, the community piece is with heavy emphasis. So in launching it, I started with something called Books Before Bars, where mm -hmm. I'm sending books into jails and prisons across the nation, not just Illinois. Things that have been pivotal for me and friends of mine that are incarcerated, because I figure if I'm working on something that, working with something that has been used to steal freedom from so many, then I got to be screaming freedom at the top of my lungs while I'm doing it. And it can't be all about me, you know? So doing things like that and starting with this like give back community ethos, mm -hmm. I think that that has shown people the value in a lot of ways and that, you know, I'm for real and I'm gonna keep being me who I am. Also being in Chicago, you know, it's like music industry is treacherous, point blank. And um, being a black man is difficult. You know what I'm saying? And there have been so many pitfalls and as you said, ups and downs to my journey and my trajectory. Um, but Chicago has always held me so dearly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like focusing on home where it's like, you be in Chicago, you might just be in the trenches and meet somebody who I've directly impacted and helped in the flesh. You know what I mean? So, and they're, very aware of those things. Yeah. So it helps. Uh, I want to talk, you brought up two words and they're very important <laughs> and I want to bring it up. You said home and and people treating you with, in a certain reverence. When I was reading your story, the impact that Ghana has had on you. Cause I had no idea until I started to research that your, your, your dad's African. Yeah. And so you've been going to Ghana <clears throat> since you were a kid. Mm -hmm. Talk about the impact that it had on you as a kid and then we'll get into how it, what you're doing uh, kind of now to try to, to bridge, you know, Africa and American relationships from, from the diaspora amongst our community. I think as a child, going to Ghana for the first time gave me context, as it still does to this day. The privilege of having a direct communication with my ancestry, however, was probably lost on me as a kid. That's something that I've started to understand more recently. Your father's from Ghana? My father's from Ghana. My entire family on my father's side lives in Ghana. He's the only one to come to America. So that's always been something I was aware of. But more recently, I started to realize 
like I said, how privileged I am because most of the closest people to me in this life have had that awareness of their ancestry stolen from them. And I think that we as black Americans obviously can attribute much of our struggle to our uprooting from our home, you know, and our lack of context about our history and deliberate miseducation about our history. So I know mine, you know what I mean? I really, I know ours, you know what I'm saying? And so that's given me just strength and, and confidence. So even as a kid, when I first went to Ghana, I was a soccer player at the time. That's what I was really into. And I came back so nice, you know what I mean? Like I came back ill with it, you know? And I was like, I think I came back with a different swag and just like, it wasn't cool to be African yet. It was African booty scratcher time. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was a moment, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't cool to be African yet as it is becoming and is kind of now. Um, but it still gave me context because I felt like somewhat of a pariah in childhood because it's like my pops is African, so I'm not really black enough. I don't really know all the cultural cues and all that shit. My mom's white from upstate New York, and that's a whole different fucking world. And I'm on the south side of Chicago, so that's in the house. But when I leave the house, don't nobody know that there's anything different, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, so it just gave me perspective. And to this day, it just being in Ghana, being Ghanaian, learning more, appreciating that privilege, recognizing that with privilege comes responsibility and also opportunity has just given me global perspective. So I don't view what I'm doing or what happens in America in a silo, you mm -hmm. know, as if it's all that exists. So there was a few points, but I wanted to go back to the other point because it was very insightful. Um, you said marketing over advertisement. Yeah, publicity over advertising. Yeah, that's something that's extremely important for anybody in business to understand because I think it's like 10 times more stickier if it comes organically as opposed to an, an ad. And it actually helps advertising as well mm -hmm. just to have more of a brand recognition. So now when you see an ad, now you're you're more likely to engage with that ad from that. So being that that's the case, like what what exactly is your strategy? Like come on different podcast shows. Is it is it social media? Is it print? Is it just everything all wrapped in one? It's definitely a multi-layered strategy that I've been taking with 93 Boys. I think to begin with, as I said, I wanted to make sure we were the first. So that means certain things I had to push to the side so that I got in there first. Tyson was two weeks later, you know what I mean? My claim as first black brand wouldn't have been true anymore. Tyson, um, Mike Tyson? Mike Tyson, Tyson 2.0. Um, so we got into dispensaries right before Mike Tyson did in Illinois. Um, being first, you know, really using these community initiatives, obviously to uplift the people, but also to impress our brand identity, you know, on the mind of the Chicago consumer. My brand identity is that. So ultimately I was just transferring that into 93 Boys. We did a campaign where we were giving away free gas. Gas prices was through the roof. Mm. And so we went to the gas station in the trenches and just like, stood there asking people, do you want gas? You know what I mean? And filling people's tank up and sent that around to the different platforms, you know, different uh, pages on Instagram. So they could talk about 93 boys as opposed to just me. It's bigger than, yeah. Scream down your ear, like, listen to me, we're dope. Like, I'm like, nah, send it to a bunch of different people. Let them tell you that we're dope. Like we said, you know, that's, publicity over advertisement. Because at first in the budget was billboards planned, but through studying, I, I learned that statistically billboards are actually more impactful for a largely established brand to just stay present in the mind of their consumers. But for a new 
venture, a new brand, you want other people telling your story for you. So definitely interviews and and podcasts and genetics, though. I mean, when you're talking about cannabis, it's like it's got to come down to weed. So that's a space in which we've just been doing a deep dive to really nail our genetic portfolio before even introducing new SKUs. Like mm. I've learned a lot though in the past year. One thing I didn't know coming into it is that pre-rolls are really the cream of the crop in cannabis. Why, why is that? Because well, because it's, convenient. it's, it's convenient. Super, convenient. super convenient. Very convenient and it's something that you don't buy from your weed man. You can't. Like, your weed man ain't finna roll your weed for you. A couple of them will, but that's kind of weird. You might have to get somebody to roll it for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's so a people, higher level of luxury. Yeah, it's a luxury. Yeah, it's just it's just simple. It's easy. It's all, it's also a lower price point because taxes and cannabis are crazy. Yeah. So you know, we've gotten to a space where like our pre rolls are like the highest selling skew in some stores, like across all the brands. Yeah. Um, and that's not even really geared towards the like the real heads, the yeah. real stoner smokers. Dispensary is a different game, man. It's like, especially in Illinois. So you're a finer smoker. That's for like <laughs> yeah. just regular people, yeah. bro. Yeah. Like that's one yeah. thing you'll peep is like, there are so many mothers and grandmas and just like coders and regular working people yeah. that really shop in the dispensaries. Like your weed snobs, Illinois is not there yet. The quality standard is not to that level. Like weed snobs, that are my friends will go to LA and just like buy out Jungle Boys or something because it's a flex too. But none of them shop at dispensaries in Illinois. They probably go buy my shit to tell me or say they did, but it's yeah. like, I know they don't shop in dispensaries. You know what I mean? I'm not even particularly focusing on them. Ultimately, I do want to onboard our community into the dispensary space. That is one of my aims with this brand and with this movement, but I'm also not particularly concerned with it right now because there's so many people that don't even look like us or hang with people that I've know seen it. us. Now, I've, I've seen it. It's like for that, that professional person who, I mean, they might just go out on their break and like, I got to take a couple pulls. It's like, Boom. I don't have time to take out weed, roll it up, put like, it's just, you wood. don't have time to do it. Exactly. You know what I mean? But I, I was just thinking, as you were saying, that the $10,000 gas giveaway, I'm thinking about the double entendre there. Like you're giving out gas, but you said gas is the word. That's what I'm saying. So there, there's a double entendre. That, that was the play? Yeah, 100%. Perfect, perfect. I, I just want to nail the word <laughs> gas into your mind. So when you think of 93 boys, then you think gas, you think yellow. Yeah. So we get- Why to, yellow? Just chose it randomly? No, because at the gas station, the labels for 93 or 89 are yellow, in Chicago at least, yellow and black. Mm. So that's why I went with that color scheme. Like I would like to get to a point where I can do a billboard off the side of the road and all it says is a yellow screen with gas in black letters. And you, know it's and you just know what it is. It's like Supreme. It's like Supreme. It's uh, even better. It's like... Uh, Burner, when you see that blue sea, you, you see the blue sea, and you don't need to see cook. Yeah. You know it's cool. Or like obey, you know that. That's, that's yeah, that was that was crazy. But this isn't his end. Like you know what I'm saying? No, but some things are just synonymous with brand that you don't have to see. Yeah, see. yeah. yeah. So I mean, like having a brand that's so strong that you don't even have to put its name up. Yeah. It's like it's like all money in. Yeah, you you just see the logo, and you know and it. it's already synonymous with Nipsey Hussle mm -hmm. and All Money in and a variety of other different things that come along with it. Right, you spoke you spoke about the verticals, like, like Crenshaw, like Crenshaw, Crenshaw. Exactly. right? Because that's not the name of it's the not brand, the name of the yeah. brand, but it's he synonymous puts it on enough stuff. Yeah. It's, it's synonymous. It's you know synonymous. the color. You see Crenshaw. You know exactly you're like what that's about that's not just the street. That's Nip. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Exactly. What are, What are some of the other verticals that you're looking to integrate? You, you spoke about that, like. You have obviously the flower. What else are we? Are there products? What, what else is coming with it? Um, I'm gonna answer that, but I just you, you sparked my mind with that because the person I learned about the laws of branding through learned them from the guy that taught Nipsey. Oh yeah. So I, I think that brother's name is uh, Brand Engine is what he calls himself. Okay. And so my big homie is. Laran stops and rants of 1500 or nothing. Mm -hmm. So those are mm -hmm. Nipsey Hussle's yeah, yeah, day yeah. one primary producers, um, Inglewood, LA guys. 
And so he's the one that taught me the, uh, the laws of branding. And interestingly enough, I was trying to think what was Nipsey's word. Crenshaw is definitely one of those words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And mar marathon. marathon. Yeah, and marathon. Yep. He changed his colors sometimes between blue and red. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that was his color scheme. Those were his words. You know what yeah. I mean? And so in founding this, I was like, what's my color scheme? What are my words? Let me drill those into the mind of the customer. Well, you know, I don't know if you know, but we did the All Money In interview. I well, saw it. It was hard as fuck. Appreciate, oh, appreciate Thank that. you. So when, when we spoke to JP, who's Marathon, and he was saying that they got that their logo from Time Magazine, and they they took it from Time Magazine, and they did, and they was like, you know, red was an interesting choice of color because most people would have assumed like, that he would do blue grips, yeah. yeah. But um, they just wanted to do red, thought it stood stood out more, popped more, yeah. got people's attention. So it's yeah. interesting that you guys both kind of learned that similar. From the, yeah. from the same person. And that red is that color. Like you just brought up Coke, but we could have brought up KFC. We could have brought up McDonald's. Yeah. Right? They all have that similar red. Inside That's another thing about is that all of these colors, they um, automatically transmit certain ideas yep. and feelings. Feelings in you your know, brain. Mm -hmm. Off top. Like blue is kind of cool. Yep. You know what I mean? Red is obviously bombastic. It stands out. Yellow is playful. It's fun. You yeah. know? And that was another reason for going yellow with cannabis because... It's associated with fun off top. I think uh, I think a Wu Tang when I see yellow and black because it's the killer beef. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But you put the black in, it's a little yeah. hard too, though. This yeah. is now now that you said that, this is like the triumph video. I think yeah. Meth is wearing this. Yeah, I think he was. No, you think he was? Okay, I gotta go I look. He was. <laughs> That's hard. I, think he was. Um, I definitely think he yeah. was, bro. Yeah, with the with the verticals, man, the the aim is to be completely vertically integrated. Um currently we're doing well with just branding and basically white labeling. But we cultivate as well. We've been doing that before we launched the brand. So to have our own cultivation facility to build that and expand, um, to have our own dispensaries, definitely, um, to have our own transportation, our own infusion. That's, you know, the process of making oils and rosin and cartridges and vape pens mm. and edibles. The goal is to have every step of the food chain, of the supply chain. Where, where did 93 boys come from, the name? I'm born in 1993. And my partner is born in 1993. Damn near our whole team is born in 1993. And um, and the gas, you know? <laughs> gas again. This gas. Guy, you know what I'm saying? Well octane, played, man. Gas is well played. All gas, no well, brakes. Well so let's look. Damn, that's a good one. I never even thought of using that. <laughs> We do. We we say never run out of gas. That's the one we use. But okay. all gas, no brakes is crazy. <laughs> there it is. Never run out of gas. You see, like that. Ab, check the back. See if they got write gas it, in there for Write it down. <laughs> we uh, know some people. <laughs> so let's let's talk about Africa. Back. Go back to that for a minute. So, being that you know, you have half of your roots in Africa, half of your roots in America, your biracial, a variety of different things going on. But it's a whole wave of people go back and going back to Africa now. Mm. From Afrobeats to the year to return, Ghana has done a great job as far as marketing themselves. So going back so. to marketing. Yeah, they've done a great it. job. They've done the best job out they of have. any African country mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. marketing themselves to African Americans and yes. black people in America. Yeah. And it's it's been a pipeline of people going from America to Ghana. Yeah. Um, I think the next phase of, right now is it's more so on, on like, you know, entertainment for the festivals and going to see the slave dungeons and different things of that nature. But I think the next phase has to be like now real infrastructure and real business. And that that to me, I think, is really when changes start to happen. So mm -hmm. are you interested or are you looking at actually creating business or investing in Africa and Ghana? Yeah, one hundred percent, man. We just launched the Black Starline Festival. Congrats, on Ghana. Thank you, bro. Yeah. Um, and that was my entire mission: is that I believe that the collaboration of Black Americans and continental Africans, and the building of businesses and lines of communication, is perhaps the most promising route to freedom and to overcoming the common enemy and the oppressions that we all face. And Ghana has been this, you know, Ghana has been this gateway since inception. Ghana gained independence in 1957. Um, and Dr. King, Coretta Scott King were present at 
the nation's coronation, you know? Martin Luther King, I mean, uh, Malcolm X was speaking at the University of Ghana early. Maya Angelou wrote a book in Ghana very early. Stevie Wonder was performing, Tina Turner. Ghana's been this, you know, but everything is cyclical. So that is coming back around in a moment when we're all visibly aware of what's going on. You know what I mean? Making it the perfect place for Black Americans to come and build businesses and, you know, industries. And the continent of Africa has so much promise. Like Africa is constantly growing, whereas populations elsewhere are dwindling or mm -hmm. slowing down. Yeah, you know what I mean? Africa's fastest population, growth rate. Mm -hmm. fastest growth rate, very young. And not only that, Africa is one of the most interconnected as far as mobile money. Like Africans are using mobile money transfer services yeah. more than anyone else. Like I can't even go to the grocery store in my hood and tap my phone. You know what I mean? I get frustrated because if I leave my wallet, I got to go home. You can send someone money mobily anywhere in Ghana to a street vendor selling mangoes. I could pay her. We spoke about phone. that with Davi though. We went to Nigeria and there's a whole thing in Kenya called a peso, I think, a peso. Peso. Um, it's a, a lot of different places in Africa where the mobile, especially in um, in areas where there's no like banking system banking deserts, yeah. or in um, rural areas. And he was saying like, I think he invested in a company. I forgot the name yeah, of it. Yeah, we call it Momo in Ghana. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they was telling us about how, what you just said as far as the, the cell phone banking and all of that stuff is more advanced over there than other places yeah. out of necessity. Yeah. It's just too. more, yeah, and it's more ubiquitous. It's like everywhere, like I'm telling the truth, Chicago, I'll go to the grocery store and cannot pay if I forgot my wallet. I can buy mangoes on the side of the road using my phone in Ghana. And to anyone with an industrious mindset, that should immediately spark possibility. Yeah. You know, I don't know exactly what you do. Maybe it's investing in one of those mobile money companies. Maybe it's starting something. Um, maybe it's becoming a facilitator, you know, but there are so many opportunities in that way that we should be taking advantage of as black Americans, but also we have to come and do it respectfully and we have to do it ethically, man. So that's why with the Black Starline Festival, we wanted to make sure that we came in and didn't just take, because yeah. that's the narrative of interaction with Africa is extraction. They come, take the diamonds, take the gold, take the human beings, take the coltan out of the Congo, take the oil out of Nigeria, and it finances someone else. And so as revolutionary African people, we couldn't come back into the space and just like instantly just want to make money. So it was like, make the Black Starline Festival a free festival for the people. I went with my father, started building clean water facilities. Um, a lot of communities don't have clean water in Ghana, mm -hmm. across Africa, across the world, but definitely in Africa, that's a big struggle is to have clean drinking water. And so we started building clean water facilities and making sure that we're stepping in with respect and providing for the people and bringing something to the table. Yeah, you're not only just providing for the people, but you're bringing artists, right? So you had Eric Badu there. Exactly. You had uh, Toby. Shout out to Toby. That's that's the family. Super dope. You had T Pain out there. Sure. Jeremiah, another Chicago guy. What was that like? Another Ghanaian artist. And yeah, and then you combine them with combined, Ghanaian artists yeah. and just to have, like you said, a free concert. Going as a kid and seeing that now, mm -hmm. last year, that's why when you first mentioned it and Black Star yeah. Line, I mean, just the name itself. Right. I'm from Jamaican descent. Oh, dope. And so, you know, obviously Marcus Garvey and the the homage they pays to that. But what did that feel like for you watching it as a kid and knowing what you just brought back to this place that means so much to you? It was a surreal moment and a blessing, an experience I'm just in, eternally grateful for. I don't think I could have ever imagined that as a kid because Ghana and America felt so worlds apart and I couldn't have seen it, you know. But in that moment, watching like these young Ghanaian artists called the Kumericans who do Ghanaian drill music 
and they wear like traditional war garments and turn up to crazy drill beats. Like yeah. watching them jump on and off stage right before like Dave Chappelle and Quali and Jeremiah and all that shit. I was like, Phew. that's crazy. This came together. You know what I mean? Like so, so blessed because it was just a vision. You know what I mean? It was just an idea that I had and a uh, need that I saw. I mean, I do think that the greatest businesses are built out of necessity, obviously. Well, you how'd you, how, how is it profitable? Or how, 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 do you, how does it a business? Because I'm sure you got to pay these artists and different things. Like so if it's free. It's brand new. You know what I mean? But if you look at Global Citizen Festival, for example, um, this is like a philanthropic festival that they do in New York. Yep. You know Central what I mean? Park. They just did it in Ghana, mm -hmm. too. And, um, you know, they're raising money. I'll tell you the truth. Them people ain't hurting, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, one of my big homies told me something a long time ago. He was like, it's possible to do well while doing good, you know? Mm. And I think that, like, right now, we're still figuring out what it really looks like. But I know that there is a way in which we can be providing free experiences for some or reduced income experiences for some, selling high value VIP tickets for others. Sponsors, who, sponsorships. Who sponsorships yeah. is the main key, actually. Yeah. Um, and it's like creating an experience that is enjoyable, safe, and comfortable for everyone at their level of luxury you know it's like if you ain't at no level of luxury you're gonna be happy to get into a festival for free at all or get yeah. into a music festival at all because the reality of what's going on in ghana particularly is that these festivals are primarily targeted at americans and uh like europeans mm -hmm. yeah. many african europeans but those are the people that can afford them like my cousins can't afford that you know what i mean there's no way yeah. if they didn't come with me they wouldn't be they, in. They wouldn't be able to. No. I mean, think about it. Tickets are maybe at the low end, 100 bucks, 150 bucks. You're doing something. it again this year? We're doing it again. Tell them, tell them where you're going. I think we're moving it. Tell them you know where you're I mean? going. We're working on building it in Jamaica. Thank you. Know you. Yeah, to my heart. Yeah. <laughs> working on building it in Jamaica. Um, and yeah, you know, my family can't afford that. Tickets are $150. My cousin works for like $80 a month. Mm. So it doesn't equate, you know what I mean? Um, so he's going to be happy or somebody in his position is going to be happy just to be in a festival. But then you got another person that, you know, drills oil over here and like they don't want to be over there Same with space. everybody else. They're going to want to be in a VIP area and they want to pay for it. And that's where they'll be comfortable and they'll be happy. So I want to create and tailor an experience where everybody can enjoy themselves in the way that they see fit, you know what I mean? Is is the Jamaica idea to have, I mean, going from America, having Ghanaian presence inside of Jamaica with Jamaican artists as well? 100%. Woo. 1,000, 1, 1 million percent. I Please. mean, the, the idea was always something that was traveling. Like when I first started to consider this, I was leaving Ghana and going to South Africa. And I was spending time in South Africa doing a podcast with some young brothers that have a thing called the Sobering Podcast. Hip hop is like crazy in South Africa. They got a vibrant scene, thriving. And these guys knew all my music. You know what I mean? They knew like verses I forgot about from seven years ago. You know what I mean? My homies, my whole clique, they knew everything. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting at the hotel that night, just like eating dinner on a roof in Johannesburg, thinking like, how is it that I've never performed in Africa. Like I'm African, I'm a first generation immigrant and I've performed Europe a million times. You know what I mean? Like not just main cities, not just London, also Leeds and Liverpool and not just Berlin, Dusseldorf, not just Amsterdam, Oslo, Australia, South Korea, um, everywhere, bro, except for the continent of my origin. And so I just started to think there must be a way that I can create a cultural experience where I'm bringing the black artists because I know that the vast majority of them have the same experience as me. We go where we get booked and where the money's coming from. So it's from not Africa, but something's got to give because these people love the music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They listen to the music and it's not peripheral. It's like 
they love the music. You know what I'm saying? It is significant to them in their lives. They're living with it. They're learning from it. And they wish we would come. So I knew there would be a way. And I knew that it would involve a lot of favors, <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot of friends, and just like people believing in that vision and that it should move around. So mm -hmm. I was there in South Africa. Obviously, I'm thinking Ghana. You know, I'm thinking about Chance. Um, I'm thinking about just other friends of mine like Kehlani and, you know, just big artists with a revolutionary mindset. And I was also thinking it should be in South Africa. It should be in Ethiopia. Chano was the one that suggested Jamaica. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I'm saying? Because his grandfather was uh, Garveyite. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And so like, now I think we're kind of like just thinking about drawing like a, the triangle. a global star. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Triangle too, though, you know what I mean? Our shape, you know what I mean? Like globally, um, of global blackness and yeah. painting that picture. I love it. I love right. it. We saw a chance in Chicago at Soho House. He was telling us about it. And what y'all was doing at the Soho House? <laughs> I was in my hood. Yeah, yeah, I mean, everybody was there that yeah, night. Yeah, was that was, I don't know what was, was going on. That was, that was everybody. Was blog, <laughs> We'd be at the Soho House. Yeah, everybody. Let's yeah. find he out. He told us about everybody it. Everybody was going to sneak in. in. We, we said that we, we, had, we weren't going to make it, but this year we will be in Ghana. Um, at the end of December. We're doing, we doing an event. We're doing an event out there. What y'all doing? Um, so we got a show called Market Mondays. We talk about stocks investing. So we're on a world tour with that show. We did Toronto. We did London. We're going, we're going to Chicago. To, yeah, right. Um, we did LA. And then the last stop of the year is going to be in Ghana in December. Yeah, so that's oh, great. Yeah. We, we'll come to Chicago and then Ghana right Are after. Are you speaking to people out there? Yeah. Do you Absolutely. know who you're talking to yet? We're still working on it. Let's talk, man. Let me right. let me think about that. Cause yeah. Because I got some, I got, I got an ill nigga for y'all to talk to. Y'all should talk to Chatter. Okay. I got Chatter. He owns like all the hotels that we stay in. He was a huge help and just like a a, a blessing in the festival because he's got these brilliant hotels. One of them called the One Oxford Hotel, and he gave us mad rooms. You know what I mean? And that's where Toby was staying and Jeremiah was staying. And um, but Cheddar also does like natural resources and drilling, a lot of development and. Um, that guy could talk to. I think it would, it would be a nice. Nah, let's, let's, connect, yeah. let's connect the dots on that. We got to do, do it. We got to do it. That would be, be a pop. But he's a. I'm telling you, like this dude will blow your mind though, because like his ambition is so boundless. You know what I mean? When when uh, I took chance over there to sit down with him, and we were just talking about him helping us out with the festival, and then he took us into this room. I hope I'm not like blowing his secret or something, but took us into this room where. It was like maybe four times, three times the size of this room, but it was all full of miniature models of this smart city that he's planning in the central region of Ghana. Wow. And so it's like he's starting with the industrial component and like, you know, um, certain like mining and minerals, et cetera. And that's going to be the, you know, foundation of the city. Then over here at a safe distance is like the residential and the, um, universities he's going to build and then like you know the arch at the beginning is designed by david ajay who's a ghanaian architect who did the smithsonian yep, yep, museum yep. etc he's working on the affirmation like, yo the man is on a high level like i'm talking about this space times three all full of miniature models of this city he's building this like city of the future no nah, definitely I mean, definitely want to build it they will come y'all should talk definitely want to connect with build it they will come yeah straight up <laughs> nah, definitely <laughs> and you you pop out if you if you could make it man it's gonna yeah, be yeah man I, no i would love to man i'm so glad y'all going down there and honestly it's just like it's so dope to see the bridge like being built and used and like to be a part of it and i know it's gonna keep going and just turn into so many more beautiful things. I don't know that there's been a time when it has been a trend before for black people to go to Africa. That's a fact. You know yeah. what I, mean? I mean, that's part of the mission. And, uh, you know, just re reading from how you envisioned it, it was, let's create the new narrative. Yeah, 100%. And so if we have an opportunity to, from our platform and for what you're doing to shape the new narrative of Ghana, let's do it. Right, we I, we were joking about snowfall, but I, when I saw the episode of how beautiful they made Ghana look, it's I'm like, so far, who has done this? And so, like, we're going there with the same intent. Let's change the narrative. Let's make sure that we can bridge, you know, African Americans with the continent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nah, that, that snowfall shit was so ill, and it also did show though that it's like all this shit is cyclical. Like, 
it has happened, but we're just in a time when everything's more visible. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so it's been easier in the past to convince us as black Americans, as Africans, that we're divided, that we don't respect or care about each other. It's been easier to convince us of that than it is now. Because now it's like, no, you can see. Right. Like, people do care, it's, people want to link. It's like when Niles was saying it in Belly, when right. he was going. It was like, Africa. That, and we never far. saw why, why he wanted to go. We didn't see the visual yeah. aspects of what he was looking at. Yeah. And so like to have this generation, to have technology advance to a point was like, no, this is what's happening. Y'all should go. I, we was in Nigeria. I remember sitting at and uh, looking out in Lagos, and I'm like, I've never seen a beach in Africa before. And I'm sitting, I'm like, this feels like this could be Miami, the way this looks. But nobody's ever showed it to us before. So like, damn, that's crazy. Because Africa's beaches are shitting on Miami, bro. Like, <laughs> exactly. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> like, there's a reason why they came to them beaches and was like, oh yeah, we gotta run this place dry. Because <laughs> it's like, yo, the the wealth, and that's the thing is like. Africa has been portrayed in a narrative of poverty and, and of lack, but that's the same reason why they called uh, Iceland that, you know, when it's really like a green. gorgeous place. They want to send you off. All green. You know what I mean? Like, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's all green. They called it Iceland so that you wouldn't come. Like, Africa has been portrayed as poverty and lack when, it, in fact, it's like the most resource-rich continent on the planet. And that's not just the gold in the ground or the diamonds in the mines or the coltan in our iPhones. Like that's literally the beaches, the like wildlife, the the water, the fruit. It's like, I be sitting in Ghana sometimes like, I don't know how I've been tricked to thinking the city is beautiful. You know what I mean? Like I had to find beauty in it, you know? But it's like, that's real beauty. That's actual natural beauty. Like. That shit is good for your spirit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I read that. Like that, that was a place that you go to meditate. I'm like, you makes sense. To. Makes sense. Vic, I know we gotta run, my brother. Um, appreciate you. Yo, appreciate y'all. Definitely, Yo, this is man. Cool. Anything that you want to make the people aware of, or your website for your for your cannabis brand, anything like that? Yeah, man. That's 93boys.com. You can follow us on Instagram at 93 boys with a Z, B O Y Z. Follow me at Vic Mensa on everything. And, uh, you know, if you come to Chicago, man, come shop with us, man. You know what I mean? We'll be out here sometime soon, too. Yes. We will be in Chicago. Yes. And we will patron. I got y'all when y'all coming, man. I'll just make sure uh, we drop y'all. October, October 22nd, we'll yep. be in Chicago. Hey, let's take a note of that so we can. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, if you in town. If you're... <laughs> too easy. <laughs> no, for real, because the uh, the music is coming out right now. And I got a new song called Swish. That's me and Chance okay. and G-Eazy. Just came out a few days ago. The video is on the way. That's what this jacket is from. It's from the video. That's Dude. why I got this. You know what I mean? So go stream, Swish, Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, wherever you consume music. It's available. Um, album on the way. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.